help you. And tonight will be on my first uh, message in here, why assurance is so important. Some material possessions are pretty important. Having a roof over your head, having clothes to keep you warm in the winter, uh, having sufficient amount of food to eat, water to drink. These kinds of things are very important to us. But even more important are some of the spiritual or immaterial things. For example, one thing that uh, almost all of us recognize is it is important to know that we have the love of our parents, that we have the acceptance of our parents. And if you grew up in a home where you didn't have that, then that is a sore spot. That is something which handicaps you in life. Because lacking the sure knowledge that your parents loved you and that your parents continue to love you and your parents accept you is a difficulty. It's a, it's a hardship in life. The same thing is true with our spouse. It's particularly important to know that our spouses love us that our spouses accept us, and that when we go home at night, we share fellowship with our spouse, and we can talk to our spouses, and we can enjoy communion together uh, in the Lord. And that is an extremely important thing. But as important as all that is, it all pales in significance to the most important spiritual possession that any person can have in this life. And that's what I want to talk about today. And that's the whole issue of the certain knowledge that God loves you. The certain knowledge that you are secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. The certain knowledge that you will be in the kingdom of God forever. The certain knowledge that you will not suffer the torment of hell forever. That is foundational, this is my thesis tonight, that is foundational to a successful Christian life. And if a Christian does not have this foundation, then a Christian is greatly, greatly handicapped in this life and in their ability to please God and to serve God. Assurance of salvation is, I feel, the bedrock of a successful Christian experience. Now, there are basically two ways to look at assurance of salvation. And this is going to come up over and over again in this conference from all four of the speakers. One way to look at assurance of salvation is the way the Bible looks at assurance of salvation. The other way to look at assurance of salvation is the way most people look at assurance of salvation. We ran an article in our newsletter a few years ago by Alfie Austin called The Majority is Not Always Right. We could have entitled it The Majority is Normally Wrong. <laughs> and that's especially true when it comes to biblical interpretation. Uh, if we went with the majority of opinion, we'd all be Catholic, or we'd all be Orthodox, or we'd all be Mormons, or we'd all be Jehovah's Witnesses, or we'd all be liberal Protestants, or whatever. But the key is not what the majority of people say. The key is not what the great church council said. The key is, what does the Bible say? What does the Word of God say about assurance of salvation? What we're going to see is that the Bible says that assurance of salvation is what it sounds like. It's assurance. <laughs> assurance is certainty. Assurance is not hope so, maybe, could be, probably. Assurance is not having a lottery ticket and saying, you know, I might win. And thinking, you know, it's always possible my ship could come in. Biblical assurance is the certain knowledge that I am a child of God forever that I am secure in Christ, that I am in his hand, and no one can snatch us out of his hand. The great thief, Satan himself, cannot snatch me from the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing he can do to me, no way he can manipulate me or turn me or get me to do anything, can cause me to be taken out of the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, the popular view of assurance is not that way. The popular view of assurance is in the area of probability. Actually, I would call it a less charitable view would be uncertainty. <laughs> that is, you are not certain that you are a child of God. You are not certain that you are going to spend eternity in the kingdom of God. And you are not certain that you are going to avoid the fires of hell. And people go through life with great fear as to whether they are saved or not saved. Now, sometimes they suppress this fear by being very busy. 
and they get very involved in activity and church work and this sort of thing. And when they slow down, the fear begins to hit. And the fear begins to come in. Now there are two major schools, as we all know, in Christian theology. One is Arminianism and one is Calvinism, or Reformed theology. According to Arminianism, today you can be reasonably confident that you're saved, but no matter how reasonably confident you are today, you can also be certain that tomorrow you can lose it if you did have it today, which you're not sure of, but maybe possibly you did. But tomorrow you can lose it if you fall away. Now, according to Reformed theology, if you're saved today, you can't lose it tomorrow. That's the good news. The bad news is there's no mark on the elect people. And so you can't know for sure that you're one of the elect. You can't know for sure that you're not going to fall away in the future and prove to be an unsaved person. And so you go through life with what I call daisy theology in either case. You know, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. And you hope you end your life on he loves me. And that's true in both Arminian and Reformed theology. Well, we're not here advocating a system of theology, Calvinism, Arminianism, Cal-Arminianism, whatever you want to call it. What we want to advocate is what the scriptures say. And it's my contention and it will be our contention that the scriptures say that assurance is the certain knowledge that we have eternal life, that we are secure in Christ, that our salvation cannot be taken away, and that we can know this with certainty, and that is not arrogant, but in fact that is merely accepting the testimony of God. That's merely accepting what God says in his word. And to do anything less, according to the Apostle John, is to call God a liar. Now it is not a good thing to call God a liar. And yet, unfortunately, many people today do not believe that you can be sure of your salvation. I've been in a number of debates with both Calvinists and Arminian theologians and pastors who have clearly articulated the fact in the course of the debates that they're not sure they're going to be in the kingdom of God. I call that, I remember one seminary professor I debated since it said he was 99% sure he was saved. I wondered how he came up with 99%. I, I don't know where he could, how he could quantify that. I've talked to other Reformed theologians who said, I don't like to quantify. You know, when I use the term 100% certain, they say, well, I don't know what 100% means. In fact, you've got some quotes in here from some leading Reformed theologians that, that I've cited them. But I like to call 99% assurance ivory soap assurance. You know, it's slippery. It, you, it's like a watermelon. Slip. You push your <laughs> finger on it and it slips somewhere else. Well, you really don't know what you've got. R.T. Kendall wrote his uh, doctoral dissertation in England on the subject of Calvin and English Calvinism and the heirs to the Calvinists, the Puritans. And according to his studies, he said an amazing thing he discovered is the Puritan divines, and divines means the leaders of the Puritan branch of the Reformation, the English branch of the Reformation, almost to a man died in great despair that they were going to hell. They would come to their deathbeds, they would look over their lives, and they would say, I don't know if I have the fruit of an elect person. In fact, as I look at my life, I think I'm probably not saved. Now, that's a humble approach, but the problem with it is, it's not a real encouraging approach, is it? I mean, you end up having people who are despairing of life. Now, a few years ago, I was at a meeting of Bible scholars called the Evangelical Theological Society, and... Uh, uh, a man who had received his doctorate from Westminster Seminary and on the subject of the Westminster C Confession of Faith, section 18, dealing with assurance of salvation, he was there and I brought that up. I brought up R.T. Campbell's observation. He said, I am so glad you brought that up. He said, I want to clear that up. That is totally wrong. So I'm sitting there thinking, well, okay, let's hear his defense. He said, you know, I'm in the Dutch Reformed Church of America. And he said, we had a brother pastor who was dying. And he said this man was despairing of his salvation. He was going through great doubts about whether he was saved or not. And so far I'm thinking, I don't see how this contradicts what R.T. <laughs> Candle said. So far it seems to be kind of what Zane Hodges would call a nice slow one coming right over the plate that you can kind of hit out of the park, you know. I mean it's just, it's a, it's a mush ball, you know, it's the kind of thing you can hit. But, of course, this was a meeting of Bible scholars, so you don't say anything while he's giving his answer. But he went on to say that a fellow minister came to him and said, well, you know, one of the tests, and by the way, there, there's a recent book out called You Can Be Sure 
and it has 11 different tests uh, of how you can be sure. The title says you can be sure. The text says you can't be sure, but <laughs> at least the title says you can be sure. But anyway, uh, a fellow minister came to him and said, well, I understand you're despairing, but let me ask you this. One of the tests is, do you love the brethren? And the person thought, and he smiled, and he said, oh, yes, I know I love the brethren. I, I thank you, and I, now I know I'm saved. And, and I sat there, I didn't say anything, but I thought to myself, I wonder how long that's going to last. <laughs> you know, I mean, what Christian is there that every minute of every day loves their spouse, <laughs> their children, their parents, the people in their church body, let alone every believer on the planet? Certainly that's not a basis for absolute certainty that you're safe. And if he had that sort of certainty, uh, I'd be skeptical of it, A, and B, it, was probably that ivory soap variety that slipped away, just slip, slip, slipping away. With these two views of assurance, let's take a look at the biblical view of assurance and see if the Bible <coughs> does say that we can be sure forever. Turn with me to John chapter 11, a very famous passage dealing with the resurrection and dealing with eternal security and dealing with assurance of salvation. John 11, 25 to 27. If you study John 11, what you find is Jesus knew that Lazarus was dying, and so he said, guys, let's wait a few more days before we go. He got there after Lazarus had been dead for four days. He came to demonstrate what he's telling Martha, that he is the resurrection and the life, that the one who believes in him will never die, that the one who lives, uh, who may die physically, but he will live spiritually. Look at verse 25 of John 11. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die physically, he shall live that is, spiritually, and of course, bodily resurrection in the future, the glorification in the future. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die, that is, spiritually. There will be no end of spiritual existence. As Dr. Ryrie used to say at Dallas Seminary, and I always got a kick out of it, it, eternal life is eternal. And if it wasn't eternal, it's got the wrong name. You see, because it's eternal, and once you got this life, you can't get rid of it. It's like that old song from the 40s about that whatchamacallit that gets stuck and you can't get rid of it or whatever the thing. Well, that's the way eternal life is. Even if you came to the point where you said, I don't want it anymore, it's too bad you're stuck with it. Because it's eternal. And Jesus says, whoever believes in him shall never die. There is no spiritual death for the believer. And then he turns to Martha and he says, do you believe this? Now, if Martha were a good person in Christendom today, she would say, well, I hope so. <laughs> she would say, I'm not sure because my works aren't perfect. I'm not sure if I obey your commands enough. I'm not sure if I love the brethren enough. I'm not sure if I'm turning from sins enough and if I'm aggrieved from sin enough. Instead, she just blunders right out there. She didn't have a seminary degree, though, so she didn't know that those were bad answers, that those were the right answers, and she came up with what she thought was the right answer. She said, yes, Lord, I believe. Well, this sounds like certainty, Martha. What are you saying? Yes, Lord, I believe. Sound like you know what you're talking about. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Notice Jesus didn't mention he was the Christ the Son of God, to come into the world. He mentioned what he gives, being the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. And she's, when he asked her, do you believe this? She said, yes, because that's who you are. You are the resurrection life. You're the Christ. You're the Son of God. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're here. Now we know life. I know I have life. I know I will never die spiritually. Now this is a wonderful statement. And we can't wiggle or or a squirm out of the fact that she knew for sure she had eternal life. The same thing is true of the Apostle John who wrote this book. The Apostle John was told by the Lord Jesus that his name was written in heaven. Luke 10, 20. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. He and the rest of the 70 that had gone out. He was told by the Lord Jesus that he was going to rule 
on a throne over the tribes of one of the twelve tribes of Israel in the kingdom. He was told that he was going to drink the fruit of the vine with the Lord Jesus in the kingdom. He was told that he was even going to go to the point of martyrdom in his faithfulness and his service for Christ. The Apostle John knew with certainty that he had eternal life, that he was secure, that he was not going to hell. So did all of the apostles. And that's what the apostles wrote to the people they wrote to, and that's what they proclaimed when they bring, brought the message. They didn't come to people and say, I've got good news for you. If you believe in Jesus, you might go to heaven. I've got good news for you. If you trust in Jesus, you might be elect. No. They came out and they said, He who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ has an everlasting life. Peter came to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, sent by an angelic messenger. God sent an angel to Cornelius and then to Peter to bring Peter to him. And Peter brings the message. And while Peter's still speaking, the Holy Spirit falls upon them. And Peter says, These people have received the Holy Spirit. How can I forbid the waters of baptism for these people who've already received the Spirit, just as we have? Now, if you're Cornelius sitting there, do you say to yourself, I wonder if I'm saved? I mean, you're manifesting the glorifying God. And the apostle has come. And the apostle has said, you receive the Holy Spirit. He said, whoever believes in him receives the Holy Spirit. And they believed in him, and they knew they had received the Holy Spirit. The same thing with the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 16. He's speaking to the Philippian jailer, and the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. And the man believes, and he's saved. And then Paul baptizes him. And, of course, you baptize believers. That's why we call it believer's baptism. And they baptize him because they were believers. Now, I had a debate, as I mentioned earlier, with a seminary professor, and I once pointed these things out to him. I said, look, all these people in Scripture knew they were saved, and we could go on to Timothy and Titus, who are called true sons in the faith in Scripture, and they're called men of God in Scripture, and clearly they're saved. And you know what the seminary professor said? He said, well, of course, they know for sure they're saved. They knew it. And now they know it. Of course, under any theology, once you die, you're secure, you see. Once you die, you know where you're going. Unfortunately, that's a little late to find out. You'd like to know before you get there, right? But anyway, he said, they know, and the reason they know is because their names are written in Scripture. But you'd have to have your Social Security number in there for you to know. See, your name would have to be written in there. Have to have your picture or something, you know. And actually, I've got a quote in here from one gentleman who actually basically says that. Uh, another Reformed theologian who says that. You have to have your name written in Scripture. Well, now, if God wants some people to know for sure they're saved, why doesn't he want all to know they're saved? Why would God want Cornelius to know he was saved in his household, and Martha, and Mary, and Lazarus? And why would he want the apostles to know they were saved? And why would he want the people who received John's first epistle... Verses 9 through 13 of chapter 5, he's writing those verses, he says, so that they may know they have eternal life, not so they would guess, but so that they could know. Why would God want all those people to know for sure they're saved, but not the rest of us? I never could figure that out. I mean, if assurance is good for them, why is it not good for us? If assurance motivated them, why wouldn't it motivate us? If it strengthened them, why wouldn't it strengthen us? What's to be gained by having a Christian going around wondering if he's a child of God or not? And if it's good now, why not eternity? Why not go through all eternity wondering whether you're going to be cast into hell then? You see, I, I, the whole point is that God has said that the one who receives the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who believes in his name, <coughs> is born of God, is a child of God. And if we can't accept the testimony of Scripture on that, then what do we accept? I remember when I used to do college work, we'd go to people and we'd read verses like John 6, 47. He who believes in me has everlasting life. And here we're dealing with college juniors and seniors, and we'd say, now, Jesus says, he who believes in me has everlasting life. If you believe in him, what do you have? And, you know, they'd look at me and they'd come up with all kinds of answers other than eternal life. <laughs> And I'd go, let's go over this again. He who believes in me has everlasting life. Jesus says, he who believes in me has what? Well, of course, the text says everlasting life, but we know it's more complicated than that, because what you're saying is, if I just believed in him, I have eternal life. I said, that's what the Bible says. Yeah, but what about this turning from sins and cleaning up your life and promising to serve God and promising to be a missionary and all this other stuff? 
said, somehow I don't see it there. You know, Jesus just said, he who believes in me has everlasting life. That's either true or it's false. It's either a lie or it's the truth. Look with me at 1 John 5, 9 through 13. Now the whole book of 1 John, as we'll see tomorrow when I speak about the whole issue of difficult text in, in John, in the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John, is the whole of 1 John is written to deal with the issue of fellowship with God, chapter 1 and verse 4. But there is a section dealing with assurance of salvation, and that's chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. And it's very powerful, and it's not related to our works, it's not related to our promises, it's related to God's works and God's promises. Notice what it says. If, verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, and of course if we go to a court of law, we do, the witness of God is greater. If God comes on the stand and says, this is the way it is, that's a greater testimony than any man can give. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. Here's the testimony. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. When I believe in Jesus and what he says, then I have to have witness. That is, I know I have eternal life. And when I'm doubting I have eternal life, it's because I've either never believed or I've stopped believing the testimony of God. Because the testimony of God is having the witness in me. And then he goes on to say, has the witness in himself, he who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. You can't go along and say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't know if I have eternal life. I have Jesus, but I don't know I have eternal life. It's a package deal. You can't have one without the other. If you have Jesus, you have everlasting life. If you believe in him, then you know what he says is true. And therefore, you know you have life. And verse 13 is very powerful. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. That is, to believers, in this case, confused believers, believers who false teachers have come in and confused, to where they have become confused about the issue of the testimony of God. And he said, these things I'm writing to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And the majority text goes on to say, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. You see... We can know. It's not we can guess, we can hope. You know, it's not like, you know, it's sad, I think, personally, that, that the state of Texas has come up with a lottery. Because it takes a lot of money from a lot of people who can't afford it, who are thinking their ship's going to come in, and they spend a lot of money on lottery tickets. But that's not my message tonight, so <laughs> stick with this. But let's say, for example, that when they have a $4 million lottery, let's say they sell 20 million tickets, which is probably about right to maintain the whole bureaucracy and the whole thing. So let's say they sell 20 million tickets and you had a million tickets. And that'd be a pretty good deal, right? Have a million tickets, you'd have one out of 20 chances of winning $4 million. Would anybody here be absolutely sure you were going to win? No. You couldn't be sure if you only had a million tickets. And out of that, you know, I'd be sure that all these tickets, uh, some of them might be counterfeit. I mean, where'd you get these million tickets? Well, that's going to give you a million tickets anyway. <laughs> But you know, even if you have a million tickets, you can't be sure you're going to win. But what if one ticket guaranteed you winning, and in fact you didn't even have to have it in your possession? Just the fact the ticket was purchased for you meant you won. Well, that'd be a sure deal, wouldn't it? Well, that's what assurance of salvation is in the Bible. When you believe in Jesus, you know you've got your ticket. That's it, because Jesus guarantees it. He who believes in me has everlasting life. It's that simple. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who has the Son has the life. We shouldn't let people confuse us. We shouldn't let them push us off of assurance of salvation, thinking that somehow it's more spiritual to be in doubt. No, it's calling God a liar to be in doubt. Now, what are the practical benefits of a biblical view of assurance? And from now on, I'm probably going to slip into just talking about assurance. Because in my view, anything less than certainty is not assurance. 
So if I just use the word assurance from here on in, you can just assume I'm talking about certainty because that's what assurance is. Well, there are some very good things that happens to the person who knows he's, he's uh, secure in Christ. For one thing, it produces gratitude. Assurance means you're grateful to God. C.T. Studd said, if Christ be God and died for me, there's nothing too great I can do for him. And he left fame and fortune. He was one of the Cambridge Seven, who was one of the wealthiest men in England, in the family, one of the wealthiest families, one of the best educated, one of the best cricket players, which is baseball, is our version of cricket. A, a person that headed for fame and fortune, and he gave it all up to be a missionary on three different continents in a time when missions was even more difficult than it is today. Gratitude, knowing for sure that I have eternal life, produces a powerful sense of gratitude. Secondly, assurance of salvation gives you a strong desire to please God. <coughs> this gratitude in turn spurs on a sense of wanting to please God. I was in college, my senior year in college, when I heard the gospel, and I believed the gospel, and it blew me away. It was just mind-boggling to me that this could be free. It was mind-boggling to me that this was simply by faith in Christ, that Jesus was guaranteeing eternal life to me simply by believing in Him. And when I grasped that, and I believed that, and God opened my eyes to the truth of the gospel, I went crazy. <laughs> A lot of people thought I did anyway. <laughs> and I was sharing my faith on campus and going to the Rose Bowl and witnessing the people and standing in the lines at the Rose Bowl. And I went on staff with the Campus Christian uh, Organization and witnessing the people. And I, I had such a burden for the grace of God and my desire to head in a different direction where I'd been going before changed because of gratitude for what God had done. The Apostle Paul said, the love of Christ constrains us. I have a little screensaver on my machine and it's 1 John 4.19. We love him because he first loved us. I have a desire to serve him because I know he loves me. If I was going around saying, well, he loves somebody, but I don't know if it's me, it would undercut the desire to please God. This one should not be thought of too lightly. Being relieved that we're not going to hell is a powerful, powerful thing in the life of a person with assurance. I went around for years being absolutely convinced that hell existed and that lots of people were going there and that the way that was broad that led to destruction and the way was narrow that led to life and I just couldn't find the path. I was trying self-righteously to make it to heaven and I was scared to death I was going to hell. And when I finally learn of the free gift of eternal life. There was such a great sense of relief. Have you ever had a lot of pain and suddenly that pain ends? I was just talking with Ken Henstrom and he went through a long time where he had gallbladder problems. And finally they sucked that thing out of there or zapped it with a laser or whatever they do with the probes or the scopes or whatever. And he feels a lot better just nine days after the surgery. He's here at the conference. And you know, when you're relieved from pain, there's a great sense of relief. And thankfulness to God, right? Well, there's tremendous relief to know we're saved. And one of the sad things about theology today is that people are giving people good news that isn't good news. They're telling people to believe in Jesus, but they're not telling them that if you do that, you're going to be sure you have eternal life. They're left with something less. Another thing is the ability to share the gospel clearly. Now follow me with this. If the gospel is that he who believes in Jesus has everlasting life, and I don't know for sure I have everlasting life, how can I tell someone else how they can have everlasting life? Now it is true a person can go out and tell about the death and resurrection of Christ, whether they're a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or a Catholic person or an Orthodox person or a Protestant person, they can talk about those things. But when they get down to the person saying, what do I need to do to be saved, they're going to give a fuzzy message. Because if they don't know themselves, how can they tell someone else? If you don't know how to bake a cake, how can you tell someone else how to bake a cake? Well, I can't, so I can't, okay? So 
But the assurance of salvation, I can tell them because I'm like the beggar that's found the person with the bread, and I can tell them where to go to get the bread. Because Jesus gives eternal life to those who freely trust in him, simply trust in him. And related to that is a heightened ability to understand and teach God's word. Because you see, there are many doctrines related to assurance. There are many things that are related to assurance of salvation. Issues like the doctrine of eternal rewards. Issues like perseverance. Like overcoming. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3. The whole issue of being approved. Dokimas. Paul talks about being an approved workman. Or being disapproved. Ah, dokimas. <coughs> All of these issues are integrally related to the issue of assurance of salvation. And if a person misunderstands on the issue of assurance, they get into all kinds of confusion. I read a, a thesis a few years ago with a person going to Philippians 3.11 concluding that the Apostle Paul wasn't sure he was saved. I heard a paper at a meeting of Bible scholars a few years ago and the person cited 1 Corinthians 9.27 to say that the Apostle Paul wasn't sure he was saved because he said, I preached to others like, unless I myself might be ad documents, disapproved. And he said, see, the Apostle Paul wasn't sure he was saved. I mean, it's a sickening feeling, a sickening feeling to sit there and hear a person who's a seminary professor training young men who are going out to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're telling people that even the apostles didn't know for sure they were saved. Of course, if the apostles didn't know, they didn't know. And there's so many doctrines that hinge on this. You see, we were talking about this last night, but basically when you grasp the issue of the gospel and assurance of salvation, it gives you a framework to hang the Bible on. If you don't have that framework, it's like a coat hanger without any hanger. I mean, you know, it's just everything falls off. You have a straight up and down coat hanger, and nothing's going to hang on it. You have a hook and a straight piece of wire down below it. I guess you could stab it or something. But <laughs> otherwise, you can't hang anything on that coat hanger. Well, that's the same thing with assurance of salvation. And finally, assurance of salvation gives you a heightened ability to lay up eternal treasure. A heightened ability to lay up eternal treasure. You see, motivation, gratitude, a desire to serve God is related to eternal rewards. The ability to share the gospel clearly is related to eternal rewards. The ability to teach God's word clearly is related to eternal rewards, as Paul brings out in 1 Corinthians 3. If what we're doing is wood, hay, and stubble, that's not going to be rewarded. We'll be saved, but yet so as through fire. Now, all that I've said here in terms of the positive, the opposite is also true in terms of the negative. Unfortunately, a person who is genuinely saved can stop believing the testimony of God. And when they do that, they lose all of these benefits. And so what you get is a bunch of bad things. You get... A Christian who's afraid is going to hell. Or if it's a non-Christian, you get a non-Christian who's afraid he or she is going to hell. Because lack of assurance means fear you're going to hell. And related to that, of course, is uncertainty on the issue of whether God loves you. Does God love me? Well, I hope so. I don't know. I'd be nice. I'd like to find out someday, but... I guess I'll find out when we die. You can look at a quote that I've got in here from a leading uh, Reformed theologian in which he said, basically that uncertainty with Jesus is better than any other option. <laughs> Real comforting stuff, I thought. <laughs> <coughs> also, lack of assurance means you're unable to share the gospel clearly. You can't tell people how to be saved clearly if you don't know yourself that you're saved. The best you can go out and say is, I don't know I'm saved, and I can help you know the same thing. <laughs> also, you're unable to teach many Bible passages and doctrines clearly. And don't be confused here. There are people who don't believe in absolute assurance of salvation who teach many Bible doctrines clearly. And you hear them on the radio and you read their books and go, how can they be so right on in this area and so wrong in another area? Well, it, you know, it's a problem because a lot of these people are influenced by a doctrinal system. And they've got a coat hanger that doesn't work, but they bought into that system. And there's some truth in the system, so they're teaching some truth. 
but unfortunately they're not able to teach on some of the most important areas of Scripture, what Paul calls the milk of the Word. And something we'll be touching on at various times, this person is hindered in their ability to lay out eternal rewards. It can lead to disobedience. You know, there's actually a group called Fundamentalist Anonymous. <laughs> there really is. And some people, they get so burned out by being afraid of hell and not knowing if God loves them and everything else and going through the motions and going through all this legalism and all this stuff that they just say, I'm not going to read the Bible anymore. I'm not going to go to church anymore. I'm not going to pray anymore. In fact, I'm going to go to a group that helps me overcome this addiction. And they go to Fundamentalist Anonymous or something like that. <coughs> Sometimes it leads people to disobedience. Sometimes they continue to go to church, read their Bible, pray, and they're in a fraud, but their motives aren't right. And they're doing all these things so they can prove they're saved or so they can get saved or so they can stay saved or whatever. And sometimes it certainly leads to bad teaching. That people are going out teaching other people this false gospel. And if you've ever been witnessed to by people who hold this other view, it's exciting, let me tell you. I had a debate a year ago with a pastor uh, in Texas who holds to a real strong Arminian view, and uh, his, the videotapes are going all over the country, he's just proliferating them to everybody, and on top of that, I keep getting letters from him and appeals and everything else, and I write him back, and, and then I get other pastors from the same group that are writing me, and we have interesting exchanges. But they're very zealous for what they believe. And it leads to bad teaching. And it hinders the person who is a believer, if a person is a believer, and they're caught up in this kind of thinking, it hinders them in their ability to please God, to lay up eternal treasure, and to hear the Lord Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So it's my thesis today that assurance is the foundation of a successful Christian life. You remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about building a house upon the rock and building a house upon the sand. It's my view that that relates both to salvation and to the Christian life. Of course, until we come to faith in Christ, we're not on the rock. But as a Christian, if we ever stop trusting in Christ and stop believing the promise of the gospel, we start building our Christian life on the wrong foundation. We're building it on sand, and when the winds come and the storms come and the trials of life come, we don't have any solid basis to stand on, and we get blown away. But the Christian who builds their life on the foundation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and helps other people, their children and their spouses and the people in their churches and their loved ones and the people at work and all those in their neighborhoods and those around them, when they're helping others build their life on that foundation, then they've got a solid foundation to build on. Because as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, there is no other foundation than the Lord Jesus Christ. If you try to build the foundation of your Christian life on your performance and your works and you're hoping that you're doing good enough to be proving you're saved and proving you're elect and proving you're going to hang in there, then you're building your life on sand. Because as John says in 1 John 1, 8 and 1 John 1, 10, and also chapter 3 and verse 2, our experience in this life is less than perfect. We can be more and more Christ-like, but we don't attain perfect Christ-likeness until he comes for us, until we go to be with him. So let me encourage each of you to accept the testimony of God and know for sure that you have eternal life. Don't let anybody steal that from you, and then don't be intimidated into not sharing it with others. But be bold in telling other people they can know for sure they have eternal life. You know, some people don't realize that that's a way to witness. Just to tell a person, did you know that you can be sure you have eternal life? I mean, that blows people away. All you got to say is, Jesus said, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Let him chew on that for a while. It's powerful stuff. Because see, it's the word of God. And it can impact life. We've got a few minutes left for some questions. What I'd like to do is take them in written form, if I can. We may take a few verbal questions uh, at the beginning, but if you've written down any questions, send them on up. <coughs> we'll send the Kentucky Fried Chicken box by you or something. And, uh, no, just send them up the aisles or whatever, and we'll take your questions on anything I've said uh, about today.
tonight, and let's not get into everything on the issue of assurance because we're going to be hitting those issues. And in fact, while we're passing up the questions, let me just give you a little teaser for tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, Jody Dillo is going to be speaking on good works are not indispensable for assurance. He'll be talking about the fact they have a secondary confirmatory value, that potential, but they're not essential or indispensable for certainty of your salvation. Then after a break, Zane Hodges will be speaking on an important topic, assurance is of the essence of saving faith. This is a powerful topic. It's one that I've had a lot of interaction with Zane on, and he won me over on this issue a few years ago. Um, and it's an issue that everyone here needs to grapple with. The issue of, is at the point of saving faith, does every person know for sure they have eternal life at that moment? Zane makes a very powerful argument. The answer is yes. And if a person has never known for sure they have eternal life, then they've never been saved. You'll want to, you won't want to miss that. On assurance and tough text in John, the Gospel of John, and especially 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the afternoon. And then finally we have a panel discussion from 3 to 4 tomorrow afternoon where we'll be interacting on the issues that we've raised earlier in the day. Okay, do we have any questions? Someone have a question about what we've spoken about today? I got one. Which pamphlet are you reading out of? What's that? Which pamphlet are you reading out of? Oh, I'm reading out of the uh, brochure on assurance for the conference. And the schedule is in here. And there should be plenty of them out here if you don't have one with you in your packet. There's a whole ton of them out here. You can have a ton, but a couple hundred. Yes, Dr. Rodmark. Do you have a quote? Uh, uh, I do. I didn't put it in your packet, but I do have it written down, and I can uh, see if I can bring it during the course of the conference, because that's a good quote. Yeah, it is a powerful quote. Uh, by the way, it's mentioned, I believe, I may have it mentioned by uh, uh, one of the people that I mentioned in here, but I'm not sure. Yes? Well, we make some good books that would uh, allow them to write for you on insurance. Salvation. Well, we got a, about a couple hundred of them out there in the lobby. Uh, no, good books on assurance. Well, dealing with definitely with that. With that? Specifically with that issue. Yeah, specifically dealing with the issue of assurance. Um, I would say uh, Dr. Jody Dillow has a book called The Reign of the Serving Kings that certainly deals with the issue of assurance. It's not only on that issue, but it deals with that. Zane Hodges has quite a few books. The Gospel Under Siege, Grace and Eclipse, Absolutely Free Exclamation Point. Uh, a number of other books he has that specifically and, and right on deal with that issue. There's a book called Eternal Security by Charles Stanley that's real strong on this issue. Um, there are, um, what am I missing? A lot, I'm sure I'm missing a lot of things, but uh, Calvin and English Calvinism to 1649 by R.T. Kendall. R.T. Kendall has another one called, uh, what's it called, Once Saved, Always Saved. Uh, there's one by M. Charles Bell. And what's the title of that one that escapes me right now? Uh, Calvin and Scottish Theology. Calvin and Scottish Theology. Those deal specifically with the issue of assurance. That one and uh, Kendall's Calvin and English Calvinism is 1649. So those would be a few. Yes, Bob? Is the uh, Kendall and Bell book back in print? Because I've discovered them out of print. Does anyone know if the Kendall or Bell are still in print on the Calvin and English Calvinism and Calvin and Scottish Theology? Are those still in print? Um, no, uh, Kendall is not, and uh, Mel is also a part of the same, published in Scotland. And okay. I'm not sure it's still in print. You can probably get them from uh, any good theological library if you come by my office for a fee and let you look at it. No. <laughs> okay. Do you feel that the question of assurance is an indication that we need to re-examine how we share the gospel? And I'd say amen on that. Because, and Zane will be arguing this tomorrow, it's a mistake, in my opinion, and I know in Zane's opinion, to separate assurance and the gospel as though they're two separate substances. They're the same thing. It's not we lead someone to faith in Christ and then we give them assurance. We give someone assurance and then they're saved. Until they have assurance, they haven't believed the gospel. So it's a wrong approach to say, let me tell you the gospel, now you believe it, now do you have assurance? And then say later on, now you're saved, now do you have assurance? Or ask them later, do you have assurance? Because until they know for sure, in my estimation, they haven't believed what Jesus said. How could they? I mean, if Jesus said to Martha, do you believe this? And she said, no. And then he'd go, oh, okay, well, you're saved anyway. 
Uh, only way that's true is if the person has believed it in the past and become confused. And that certainly does happen. But if a person has never believed that, I'd say we're not sharing the gospel clearly. And that's going to offend some people. You know, I met a lot of people, they say, well, I was saved when I was 15, but I didn't have assurance until I was 27. And I'd say, well, you were saved when you were 27 then. And they're like, but I know what happened when I was 15. I walked the aisle, I felt the feeling. I don't care. If the, if the gospel is that Jesus gives me eternal life when I believe in him, if you believed in him when you're 27, you may have had an encounter with God when you were 15, but you weren't saved until you believed the gospel. Cornelius had an encounter with God before he was saved, right? He sent an angel to, to minister to him. And yet he wasn't saved until he believed the gospel. And if he said, well, I know I was saved because the angel came to me, that would have been wrong-headed. And a lot of people don't like to change the date of their testimony, <laughs> so they claim to some weird theology. I mean, I, say, I mean this sincerely. I have met so many people. I used to do this when I was in campus ministry, and they'd want to say, I walked that aisle when I was 12, and then later on, I, you know, I came to believe the gospel, you know, and it was just so weird. They didn't want to give up on what this other was because they were like, well, I had that feeling. I had that experience. But then that hindered them in sharing the gospel because, see, they're carrying around this thing that I had this split schizophrenic experience. I believe the gospel, but I didn't know I believed it. No, you either believe the gospel or you don't believe the gospel. So, yeah, it hinders us. And finally, with the typical Reformed tradition deny that we have the capacity about knowing we can be sure that we're saved. Typical, yes. Um, and that doesn't mean... Now, we have five-point Calvinists who are members of Grace Evangelical Society. People who absolutely say they're a five-point Calvinist and they believe in 100% certainty. So it's not that everybody who is a Reformed theologian denies the things we're talking about here. But the typical Reformed theologian has difficulty saying you can be sure. And I've got some good quotes in here. I'll be going over some of them. Uh, where I asked press people on this issue, and you can see what they said, and it was very slippery what they would say. And the typical reform answer is, you can have an assurance. But I don't like to talk about quantifying. That's what they'll say. Specifically, they'll come out and say, I don't want to talk about quantifying this. In fact, one time I said, can you be sure? And, and this, the speaker said, what do you mean by sure? <laughs> I mean, you get into weird stuff. And I asked one man, I said, can we be 100% sure that we're saved? And his answer was, according to the Puritans, you can be 100% saved and not know it. But that's not what I asked. I said, can we be saved and know it for sure? And he said, you can be saved and not know it. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I agree with that. But can you be saved and know it? Let's answer that question. So this is a problem. Well, thank you so much for coming. Don't